Thank you for joining me and welcome to today's object talk. My name is Yasmin. I'm the learning and engagement assistant at the Jewish Museum. In this talk, I will show you some objects from our collection that tell the fascinating story of how Jewish tailors and workers unions contributed to the rights that we enjoy in our own jobs today. I'm going to share my screen with you to show you some of these objects. Let's start with the Singer sewing machine and explore its connection to the tailoring industry and workers' rights. This machine was created by the Singer Company in the late 19th century. This was an American company founded by Isaac Singer and developed the first sewing machine for home use in the 1850s. It continues to be one of the most commonly used sewing machine brands worldwide. This treadle sewing machine was powered mechanically by a foot pedal and could sew more than 20 times faster than hand sewing. Machines such as these were heavily used by Jewish tailors and housewives in England in the 19th century. These machines seized upon the innovation and industrial revolution of the mid 19th century and facilitated the boom in London's tailoring industry, an industry that was greatly supported by Jewish migrant workers. This photograph shows machinists at work in a Jewish tailoring shop in the East End of London in the 19th century. You can see the machinists are using pedal operated Singer sewing machines. Many of these workers were likely recent immigrants to England. Among them is Annie Schneblina, who was born in Latvia and came to Britain with her parents and five siblings in the 1880s. Between 1881 and 1914, two million Jewish people migrated out of Eastern Europe. After the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881, rising anti-Semitism and violent pogroms forced Jewish people to leave Eastern Europe and seek safety elsewhere. 150,000 of these groups made Britain their home in what was known as the Great Migration. Many of these immigrants were housed within two square miles of East, the East End. New immigrants usually disembarked in St. Catherine's Dock, Wapping or Tilbury, and moved to the poorer parts of the East End, such as Whitechapel and Spitalfields. As many of these migrants had lost their possessions and were charged exorbitant fees to travel, they arrived with little or no money at all and needed to find work immediately. They also very rarely spoke English. Yiddish was much more commonly spoken, and so they found work with relatives or other people from their home countries. They joined what would become known as Jewish trades and usually worked in their own homes or in sweatshops. The tailoring trade was one such industry. In Russia, Jewish people had only been allowed to carry out certain low paid trades of which tailoring was one. The Great Migration therefore brought thousands of experienced tailors to London. From the late 19th to the early 20th century, Almost half of people who emigrated from Eastern Europe were employed in the garment trade in and around Whitechapel. Amongst non-Jewish shops in England, it was common that one tailor would work on the same garment from start to finish. This was a very expensive process. But the Industrial Revolution at this time brought more disposable income for English workers, which created a greater demand for inexpensive clothing that mirrored the styles worn by the rich and fashionable. The influx of Jewish tailors brought a new system to clothing production. In Jewish tailoring workshops, different people would work on different parts of the production, such as cutting the fabric, sewing things together, or pressing the clothes and adding final details. This meant that clothes could be produced more cheaply. These clothes were also ready to wear rather than being individually tailored to each customer. Most Jewish tailors were employed in women's wear, which required more skilled handwork. They were organized in small workshops under a Jewish master tailor, the middleman who subcontracted work from manufacturers. Although their bosses could be relatives or neighbors who had come from the same countries, even towns that they had, many workers were subject to low wages and poor treatment. 
Conditions in factories were extremely tough. Many people would work on one garment with each person having a different job and the workers would get paid differently based on that job. Workers were also paid based on the amount they produced, not on the number of hours they had worked. And so they had to work long hours to make as much money as they could. Work was seasonal. The busiest time was from March to August, but there was a slack time from October to December. People would often work from six in the morning until midnight with a break for lunch and would frequently be given work to take home. Jewish immigrants to London had little choice but to work in these awful conditions. The steady stream of immigrants meant that there was always people willing to do the work if others weren't, and recent immigrants took on the least skilled work at the lowest wages. This influx of workers allowed master tailors to pay less and less. And so unions developed to represent the rights of tailors. Many of the Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe came with a knowledge of involvement in groups and community groups and had a, so a strong Yiddish speaking working class movement developed in London's East End. This is a poster encouraging workers to join the Jewish branch of the Amalgamated Society of Tailors. This poster is written in English and Yiddish, reflecting how many Jewish immigrants made up these unions. The meeting for this society was at the White Hart pub in Greenfield Street. This is a notice for a general meeting held by the London Society of Tailors and Tailoresses. This meeting was held in 1889, the year of major strikes amongst workers in the tailoring industry. These strikes were called by the Amalgamated Society of Tailors. Strikers demanded work days to be 12 hours long and for regular breaks for tea and dinner, in addition to better wages and an end to having to do additional work at home. The strike was supported by 8,000 to 10,000 workers, many of whom were Russian immigrants. The strike lasted for five weeks and the workers won their demands for a 10 and a half hour workday and a limit on overtime. The strike had also been inspired by the London dock strike, where 100,000 dock workers went on strike in the same year and also won better conditions. Over time, solidarity between Jewish and non-Jewish workers was strengthened. From 1910, there was an increase in trade union action, and in April 1912, 1,500 tailors in the West End, many of whom were members of the London Society of Tailors and Tailoresses, demanded better working conditions. When these demands were initially rejected by the master tailors, over 13,000 tailors agreed to go on strike. Not all of these tailors were supported by unions, and so they soon ran out of funds to support the strike. They did, however, receive great support from Jewish workers in other industries. For example, cigarette workers provided them with cigarettes and the Jewish bakers union supplied them with bread. Yiddish theatre groups also held plays to raise funds for the strikers, and eventually their demands were met. In this same time again, London dock workers had also gone on strike. To support their fellow workers, Jewish union members agreed to foster the children of non-Jewish workers so their parents could go on strike. Over 500 children of dock workers were taken in by Jewish families. So, this sewing machine has come to represent not only the way that Jewish tailors revolutionized the London clothing industry, but also how they fought for the rights over time that have led to the eight hour workday, weekends and paid lunch breaks that we enjoy today. Thank you again for joining this object talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something new. So please join us again next time to learn about a new object and a new story. Thank you.